Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to present for you today. Um, Okay, as you just heard, um, my laboratory is based at Brigham Women's Hospital in the Center of Experimental Therapeutics at Brigham Women's Hospital. And this is the title for our talk today. Uh, Harvard Medical School requires that I show you this um, disclosure for conflicts of interest. So from our basic research uh, supported by NIH uh, grants, we uh, uncovered new molecules that are bioactive, and this became the basis for intellectual property that the institution um, presides over, and I had an opportunity to serve as the scientific founder for a company, Resolvex Pharmaceutical, uh, who had the mission of bringing this work uh, that I'll tell you about today to the clinic, uh, and I'm happy to say that the uh, company now has uh, moved on and uh, their patents have gone to other companies. So uh, inflammation, uh, as you just heard from uh, Dr. Liu, is really important in many, many diseases. And so this is uh, central now, not just to the classic, but to the new, I would say, host challenges. In addition to infection that can bring about inflammation, of course, injury, uh, there are new villains illustrated here on uh, the right of this slide, our diets, and certainly aging. Uh, but inflammation means many things to many people. So what I want to focus on is something which we defined called neutrophil swarming. And that is how white blood cells swarm in on the acute inflammatory response. And so why do we study inflammation? Because while there's very effective therapies out there, they're not without unwanted side effects. And one of the most serious side effects is, of course, eventual immune suppression. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you today our results on aspirin, which um, set aspirin apart from some of the traditional approaches, the steroids, the non-steroidals, and COX-2 inhibitors. So if we look at the acute inflammatory response as illustrated here uh, from textbooks in pathology, it becomes clear that this is a sort of uh, decision path uh, for acute inflammation. It can either go to chronic inflammation or to complete resolution. And you'll recall that the migration of cells from the blood vessels, from postcapillary venules, are really orchestrated by chemical mediators. And these chemical mediators are very well appreciated to stimulating the cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, pain. And these are primarily the prostaglandins and chemokines and cytokines. So it was widely thought that the acute inflammatory response undergoes resolution by passive process. Meaning what? Meaning that those mediators would just dilute and then the system would return to normality. And what I'll uh, tell you about today is uh, the resolvins and the super family of uh, small molecules that we identified uh, as endogenous mediators that are produced during self-limited acute inflammatory responses. In other words, acute inflammatory responses that resolves on their own. So this is an active process, and this is a change in thinking about how acute inflammation, the initial challenge, the first responders are resolved from acute inflammatory response. Over the years, we have focused on periodontal disease with our colleagues Tom Van Dyke, who's a periodontist, uh, because he's a very good example of what's called leukocyte-mediated tissue injury, when neutrophils who are normally there to defend the body from bacteria, when they congregate in excess, they can spill noxious agents that actually lead to tissue degradation. And that tissue degradation is illustrated here with the loss of the ligature, a pocket formed around the tooth that could eventually lead to uh, tooth loss. 
So we've studied this process and I'll give you an update on that. The take home message for today's presentation is really on this slide, that the resolvins and the specialized pro-resolving mediators have a few major functions. They are active in resolution programs of inflammation, they're intrinsic controllers of infection, they help to lower the dose of required for antibiotic treatment, and they stimulate tissue regeneration, all stereoselective and in pico to nanomolar range. So the outline of today's talk is the question that we're trying to address in the lab is what controls excessive inflammation and infection? Because I want to remind you that the acute inflammatory response is a protective response. It's when it's uncontrolled that it becomes an issue. So we'll first review a little bit of background on the resolvins. I want to show you an example of functional decoding metabolomics in human translation, and then the identification of new receptors for resolvin D2. And then ultimately the question we're trying to address is can we activate endogenous resolution programs in humans? So the translational potential for the protectins, the resolvents, meresins are illustrated here. There have now been many animal studies that illustrate their actions in controlling inflammation, tissue protection, infection, neurodegenerative um, diseases, and in wound healing and tissue repair. And some are illustrated here from animal models <coughs> with the colon, uh, inflammation, TMDS colitis, or airway inflammation, work we've done with Bruce Levy at Brigham Women's Hospital, atherosclerosis, or even arthritis. In animal models, resolvins uh, help to control collagen-induced arthritis. So how do we get on to doing the structural elucidation of these molecules? Well, as I said, we're interested in the acute inflammatory response, and we put on the back of a mouse this air pouch, so we could study the acute trafficking of leukocytes to form pus, this swarming, and then interrogate that pus, that inflammatory exudate, with using uh, cellular composition, for example, fax analysis, lipidomics, proteomics, and even microRNA analysis of the inflammatory exudate. And then we've extended this on to many, many animal models including studying bacteria in the air pouch, which is essentially sterile, and then determining the response of the mouse, in this case, uh, to the bacteria. And most recently, looking at human blisters. So we focused on two structural function, uh, I would say bioactions, uh, to do the elucidation. One is the need or the cessation the stopping of neutrophil further traffic so they don't over-congregate in the pus, right? Too many white cells, too many neutrophils is deleterious. And the pharmacology of this physiologic response in the add back is anti-inflammation by stopping neutrophil diapedesis from post-capillary venule. On the other side, we focus on macrophages, ability to stimulate the uptake of apoptotic, of dead neutrophils from the site, and then learned that this is also a response that resolvins carry out with microbes, helping to kill and clear microbes. So it took us a long time to recognize in my lab that pro-resolution, stimulating resolution, is not the same as anti-inflammation, that blocking chemical mediator pathways is not necessarily the same and I'll show you why, as stimulating resolution. And to focus on this, we had to introduce in animal models the use of resolution indices to quantitate these steps and get precise data. And we very recently learned that the resolvents also stimulate the clearance of fri fibrin clot um, in, by macrophages. So to give you an example of how we look at the acute inflammatory response. This is um, neutrophilic infiltration that reaches a peak and then self-resolves, in this case, around 72 hours. And so this interval here, we define that half maximal of the leukocytic traffic into pus 
is about 12 hours. So when it does not resolve, when it persists, non-resolving inflammation, as you would expect in, in sepsis, the, the neutrophil number remains up. And this gives us the opportunity to ask the question, are there specific signals for resolution that the body makes? And of course there are, and they're made within this time frame. This is the traditional resolution phase. So the first molecule that we identified in this resolution phase we called resolvin E1. And we worked out its complete structure, and it's depicted here. It has this action of stopping neutrophilic infiltration, stimulating macrophage phagocytosis, and also stopping platelet aggregation in response to ADP. And what we were surprised is when we looked at the structure of the molecule and then walked backwards to work out its biosynthesis, we learned that the precursor was eicosapentaenoic acid. And we worked this out in human cells, but the initial molecule we found in mice, and eicosapentaenoic acid is the major fatty acid in marine oils. And I'll remind you that we're not able, as mammalian mammals to produce very much of EPA. We have to take this in in our diet. And then found another resolvent E2 that limits PMN infiltration, and then resolvent E3 was recently born by a former fellow of my lab who was at Tokyo University, Makoto Arita, and this is called resolvent E3. So hypoxia is the trigger of um, endothelial cells in neutrophils interacting to produce resolvin E1. Now when aspirin is on board, which blocks prostaglandin formation, as you know, we found that it actually triggers the formation of 18 EEP in the chirality of the R chirality here at this 18 position hydroperoxide, which then is converted to resolvin E1. So resolvin E1 main action we think is illustrated here. So these are white blood cells, these white dots, uh, walking along a postcapillary venule. And if you add topically resolvin E1 or by perfusion, you can see that those white blood cells bounce off the endothelium so they don't stick and go through the tissue. And we think that's a major uh, action of the all the pro-resolving mediators. So here, when we looked further into the inflammatory exudate uh, using this assay of uh, picking up apoptotic PMN, dead cells at the site by macrophages, we found that the macrophages use DHA to make these four compounds, which we call resolvin D1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, you'll recall that DHA is also a marine oil, and is enriched in the brain. But it turns out that the innate immune system in inflammatory exudates uses DHA to make these D-series resolvins, as well as this uh, epoxide intermediate that becomes this dihydroxy compound called protectin D1. And we worked this out with Nicholas Bazan in neural systems, and, we, and when it's generated in the brain, it's called neuroprotectin D1. So when aspirin is present, it produces the R epimers of the D-series resolvins, and it does so by acetylating uh, cyclooxygenase 2. And why is that important? Because the R epimers turn out to be longer acting in vivo. There's chiral preference there. And then late in the acute inflammatory response in that congregation of pus we find that DHA is converted to another family by the macrophages we call marisins or the macrophage-derived mediators of resolution, and this is MAR1, which is also a dihydroxy uh, alcohol that we determine the complete stereochemistry. Now, we did the initial structural elucidation illustrated here by using mass spectrometry and, of course, the biological actions. But to be able to assign the double bonds and the, <coughs> and the stereochemistry of each of the alcohols were unable to use NMR because of the small amounts. We had to rely on total organic synthesis and matching on LCMSMS and in biological actions to be able to assign the stereochemistry of the alcohol groups and the double bond geometries of these endogenously produced molecules.
And here's an example of the resolution indices. And here, if we add a time zero, we reduce the amplitude of the acute inflammatory response by giving a resolvin, and therefore shorten the resolution time. But what we were surprised to find is that if we added at the maximum point and did a treatment type experiment and add a resolvin to an animal model, it actually shortened the resolution interval and this opened up the opportunity for us to begin to think about resolution pharmacology or stimulating with agonist the resolution of, ac of acute inflammation. So how do the pro-resolve mediators work? Well, it's a novel mechanism of action. The SPMs limit the further recruitment of PMN, but stimulate the recruitment of mononuclear cells, and they are not immunosuppressive. They help clear the apoptotic cells, microbes, and debris, and dead PMN. They also counter-regulate the initial mediators produced in the acute inflammatory response, the prostaglandins, the leukotrienes, platelet activating factor, and they counter-regulate a whole host of chemokines and cytokines, as well as control ROS production and edema. So now that we have synthesized many of the major resolvents, we were able to go back and use the resolution indices in animal models to ask how do we shorten the resolution in interval? How potent are the molecules? And so with very small amounts, just 50 nanograms per mouse, you can see that resolvin D3, for example, greater than 90% shortening in the resolution interval. And this is either with the E. coli infection and inflammation or a zymosan-induced inflammation in vivo. So, as part of the backdrop for the discussion today, we identified several receptors illustrated here that are GPCR receptors, G-protein couple receptors in mouse and human, where they specifically act as agonists. For example, lipoxin A4, resolvin D1, shares one receptor, another receptor for E1 that's also shared by E2, and the resolve in E1 also crosses over on the leukotriene B4 receptor. And we very recently identified GPR32 in humans uh, receptor. And I'm going to talk to you now about resolve in D2 receptor. But it's important to point out that the resolvins do not activate nuclear receptors. And the general consensus in the field now is that they downregulate NF kappa B, turn on specific microRNAs, and they upregulate the heme oxygenase one system. So what I can say at this point for you is that resolution of acute inflammation is a highly coordinated and active process that is controlled by endogenous pro-resolving mediators. It's not just simply a dilution of the acute inflammatory mediators. So we can put together this illustration that in the early stages, the acute signs of inflammation are brought about by the prostaglandins, the cardinal signs of inflammation. And remember, you need that acute trafficking of neutrophils to combat bacteria, shown here on the left. But what we found is that there's a lipid-mediated class switch with time, illustrated here as the traffic light, to switch the lipid mediators to ones that are pro-resolving to help clear out the traffic and take away debris. So the new concept, it's not just that it's active, but at time zero, the resolution process begins not as a simple yin and yang at one time point, but as a gradient of mediators leaving and mediators coming in to actively bring about resolution. So if we think about this as anabasis and catabasis, the illustration here, the resolvins and the lipoxins serve as stop signals and hopefully get us back to normal resolution. So there are clearly issues when we can think about failed resolution bringing about disease or the persistence of inflammation. 
and we uh, penned this uh, together as a consensus with the uh, British Pharmacology Society as a consensus report. And subsequently, we've been able to identify that there are a number of failed resolution diseases, at least in animal models here. For example, obesity, asthma, and some aging models. And those are illustrated here in publications we've done with our colleagues. Now, for tissue regeneration, we turned to a very simple planaria model. It's a little worm-like structure where we can cut the head or the tail off and then ask the question, are there specific mediators that regulate the regeneration of the head in this case? And yes, resolvent E1 and MAR1 are able to do that. But the big surprise, as I mentioned in, in these studies, was that the, these pro-resolving pathways can regulate sepsis and um, bacterial responses in animal models. So in this report with Nan Chang in my lab, we found that during infection in animal models, for example, of E. coli peritonitis or uh, Staph aureus in the skin, in addition to the in initiation of mediators, the host response also turns on pro-resolving mediators and that they help to accelerate the containment and the clearance of infection. And that when we added them back together with traditional therapies, antibiotics, we could actually lower the requirement of the antibiotic dose required. And why are we interested in that? Because of the rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So as I mentioned, adipose tissue is one of the places where resolvents are produced, and they're produced primarily by the crown macrophage um, during, uh, in obese tissue, and they can counter-regulate the adipokines and the chemokines, uh, as illustrated here, work we carried out with uh, Juan Claria while he was on sabbatical with us. So now I want to give you an example of functional decoding metabolomics. And once we were able to complete the complete st uh, structural assignments of each of the mediators and their biosynthetic pathways, we operationalized using targeted LC-MS-MS approach with these two fellows who are now in uh, the William Harvey in, in London and have set up the system there as well. So we profile and target now the main pathways uh, to produce resolvents, protectants, and maresins using deuterium label. So to benchmark our system, we use the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and this is their, their serum and plasma samples. And this is nice because it's a composite of over 100 healthy donors in the states. Uh, demographics, and you can see that we can see all the prostaglandins, leukotrienes produced from arachidonic acid, the E-series resolvents, as well as the D-series resolvents, protectants, and maresins made during resolution. And then we can do this very simple uh, small demonstration experiment that I hope maybe you'll do when you get home, or maybe even tonight. And you can take EPA and DHA, and then two hours later take a low dose, 81 milligram aspirin. And we ask the question then, if we draw blood and we take the plasma, and if we take off the whole blood, can we do LCMSA co computational analysis using LCMSMS? And how does this relate to the clearance of fluorescent E. coli using fax analysis? So you can see very clearly by four hours, with uh, increasing the N3 uh, fatty acid intake and with aspirin on board, this very different cluster of uh, mediators that are produced. We can identify them all by MSMS spectra, and these are, of course, the resolvents coming up uh, in whole blood. And then if we look at the phagocytosis, the functional side of this, we can see very clearly that there's an increase at four hours in the ability of peripheral blood leukocytes in whole blood to phagocytize fluorescent E. coli. And if we do a regression analysis, we can see that the summation of the resolvents produced with aspirin on board, they're illustrated here, there's a quite nice 
uh, R squared is 0 0.77, indicating that the presence of those mediators enhance the phagocytosis and correlate with it um, in, in whole blood ex vivo. So this is an example of functional metabololipidomics. So now that the, we've done the structures, uh, many of the compounds are commercially available now from a variety of sources. And in addition to all lab, many laboratories have added now from around the world, um, most re of which organs produce resolvents. Most recently, we identified and profiled from just human tears the, the resolvents in 100 microliters. And I point out this uh, urine study here uh, coming from Japan. We focused in on resolvin D2 because it showed preference for increasing uh, in many of the studies, for example, in breast milk and work from Trevor Morey's group showing that this is increased in, uh, in Australia and in placenta. And so we focused on the identification of its receptor. And we did that by a screening method uh, for resolvin D2 and using functional assays. And so the system that we liked very much is uh, now commercially available. It's a DiscoverX system using a beta arrestin chemiluminescence. And so we could screen this orphan library and found uh, three uh, signals that light up. And then go and do complete dose responses. But we could see that only one of these three receptors gave a nice signal with resolvin D2 at 10 nanomolar. And so we had to make a radial label to abs absolutely establish this receptor. And in its recombinant form, it gave around a 10 nanomolar KD, uh, which is respectable in uh, CHO cells expressing the human receptor, and a Skagit plot. And we recently reported this here uh, the key point is that it signals through cyclic AMP and m mounts phagocytosis in macrophages. But we went on to make a uh, knockout mouse to further prove this. And you can see that here is the wild type. It resolves in about 12 hours on challenge. In the knockout, that moves to 18 hours, so quite a substantial delay. And if we look at aferocytosis, the aferocytosis of the knockout is much delayed. This is also the case when we looked at, at E. coli infection with um, giving resolvin D2. And you can see the knockout response is quite diminished um, in this arena. There's a reduction of the exudate PMN infiltration shorten resolution, it's going to increase apoptosis, increase macrophagia ferrocytosis. <laughs> and we re obtained similar results with Staph aureus. We also went on to a sequel ligation puncture model, which is a polymicrobial sepsis. And you can see here that the knockout uh, has substantially different response, the knockout of this receptor. So we wanted to look at more at the signaling. And with Stephania in my group, we, we went to CYTOF looking at uh, this is mass spectrometry together with uh, uh, flow cytometry. And we looked in whole blood because we wanted to get the human signaling response. And what's nice about this approach is that you can do individual single cell analysis. And here's the whole human blood gating. And then the response when adding resolvin E1, and we add them to whole blood at the concentrations that we found them to be produced. So RVE1, D1, D2, lipoxin B4, MAR1, and you can see very clearly that they activate PERC phosphorylation and PCREB, predominantly in neutrophils and macrophages. And that's illustrated here on a single cell level. It's not possible to read this, but we're able to work out the intracellular signaling in whole blood now. Now, if we went back to the knockout and knocked out that receptor, you can see very clearly that the signal transduction pathway is lost between wild type versus the knockout of resolvin D2 receptor. So this is a very powerful technique to tell us the signal transduction pathways utilized by the resolvents in individual cells. And that's illustrated here. You can see that this receptor with resolvin D2 
regulates phosphorylation signals as well as cyclic AMP for phagocytosis. So by studying self-resolving exudates, we identified chemical signals produced in vivo that we've been focusing on in their host defense abilities, but they've also been shown to reduce pain, stimulate wound healing, tissue regeneration, and they even stretch into the adaptive immune response with actions documented in the literature now by many groups on both T and, and B lymphocytes. So by this simple trafficking, I want to urge you that probably some of your traditional therapies uh, not act by antagonism, but maybe by stimulating resolution. And we found that many of the traditional agents that are used to treat inflammation are actually resolution toxic. They delay the uh, resolution of acute inflammation. And so since we have been targeting our efforts on the receptors, we've made a number of analogs illustrated here, and we've put them into human trial. And we have an ongoing trial right now supported by NIH in the periodontal disease where I designed a mouth rinse that's being tested at the foresight over in Cambridge by Tom Van Dyke. And the company, Resolvex, uh, made this drug, an eye drop, to look at dry eye inflammation in the eye. And 232 patients were treated with that dry eye drop of Resolve in E1 and shown to be effective in reducing inflammation there. So <clears throat> some of the new concepts that have come from this work have been brought up in the New England jour Journal of Medicine because we recently found that when statins are on board, you can trigger another series of resolvins, this 13 series, and they have the ability to enhance, again, the clearance of bacteria. So I don't want to leave you with this notion that uh, fish oils are, are uh, some miraculous substance, but I want to point out that the, that the fish oils themselves contain a mixture of many, many substances, and we've only worked out the which may be responsible for their failure in a lot of clinical trials. And we've only worked out the structures of how EPA and DHA are used de novo to make very specialized molecules that control resolution. So, and I want to leave you with this thinking of a, a shift in paradigm away from inhibitors alone to using agonists to stimulate uh, resolution of inflammation, and we hope that this would not be eventually immunosuppressive. So I've given you some background on resolution, give you an example today of functional metabolomics, and then at least one of the circuits that we're working on and the receptors to bring about what we consider a new field of resolution pharmacology. So I have to thank the members of my laboratory, Nan Chang, that contributed to today's presentation, Stephania Librios, and of course, we have a program project team, and the entire team is il illustrated here, focusing on resolution mechanisms of inflammation. So I thank you for the opportunity to present this to you today. Thank you.